It's titled, How Do We Move Beyond CRPD Recommendations and Guidance to Implement the Abolition of Forced Psychiatric Interventions Everywhere. And the format is going to be a panel discussion, um, hopefully to focus on strategies. There are going to be two sets of questions, or two rounds of questions that I will ask the panelists. First, I'm going to do a brief introduction um, and introduce the panelists. Then we will proceed to the two questions, and then we will have a, a quite large opportunity for discussion and audience participation. So if there are aspects of this that you've already been working on in your countries, we, we very much welcome you to bring that up as well. Or for other people at the UN, if there are, um, if there are issues that are more systemic, or even for, for international NGOs and DPOs, we can raise the systemic issues as well. So, um, as we know, the CRPD unequivocally prohibits forced psychiatric interventions. I'm not going to go into the details of the text and the concluding observations and the general comments. I assume people are familiar with that. We have. The, the concept note for the side event that's available online and some paper copies on the desk back there if people would like to have that. Uh, okay, so, and, and I encourage you, if there are things that you don't understand from the panelists' presentations, please feel free to ask, because I think that we may all be assuming a level of, of great familiarity with what's already been out there. So, we know there is a gap in implementation of this particular obligation under the convention to, to prohibit and abolish forced psychiatric interventions. Why? Can we attribute this to faulty understanding and who's faulty understanding? To power inequalities, such as the power inequality between people who have been labeled with psychosocial disabilities and service providers or between us and the society as a whole, people who have not been so labeled? Can we attribute it to indifference of government officials and legislators? Why has this issue led behind even other reforms in the area of legal capacity and where are the points that we could intervene more strongly and, and change the situation that we now have? The concept notes suggest two areas where international efforts have been focused, legal reform and changes in policy and practices. Panelists are invited to address both dimensions in answering the two questions that I will put to them. We're disappointed that the CRPD chair, Mr. Basharu, is unable to be here due to delays in processing his visa. That's very unfortunate. However, it will give us more time for discussion and interaction with each, with each other. The panelists will respond in, in, in this order. Hege Orofelin, Alberto Vasquez, Sharon Primor, and Marcus Sheffer. Um, and I will, I, I will proceed to introduce them and um, very briefly, Mr. And I guess I'm going to introduce them in reverse order because of the way I have it here. Mr. Sheffer is a member of the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and a professor of constitutional and administrative law at the University of Basel, Switzerland. Um, Ms. Primor is a lawyer and a social activist from the organization Biskut in Israel. Mr. Vasquez is the chair of an organization called Sociedad y Discapacidad Sodis in Peru. Hege Orofelin is a lawyer and activist from Norway. So I'm going to read the first question. The first question is, what is the most important step that your country could take to implement the abolition and cessation of forced psychiatric intervention? Cessation means complete ending. Or for, um, for Mr. Shepard, uh, and, and really for anyone, but 
particularly for Mr. Shepherd as a CRPD member, based on your experience with country reviews, what are the most common obstacles to implementation of the abolition of forced psychiatric interventions and what needs to be done to remove them? I give the floor to Hege Orfeldt. Thank you, Tina. My country, Norway, has a long way to go to implement abolition of forced psychiatric interventions. Our advocacy in Norway is a very steep hill, as the Norwegian government does not recognize the discriminatory nature of forced psychiatry, the systemic human rights violations it constitutes, or the extent of the harms done through these practices. In Norway, the Mental Health Act authorizes deprivation of liberty based on psychosocial disabilities as well as intrusive medical practices like forced drugging, forced electroshock, physical and chemical restraints, and solitary confinement, all which are prohibited by the CRPD and falling under the scope of the absolute prohibition of torture and other ill treatment. Despite decades of critique and concerns from national and national human rights monitoring mechanisms, the Norwegian government still deems psychiatric coercion legitimate and claims appropriate use of coercion can save lives and constitute good care. Such approach negates equal capacity and rights of persons with psychosocial disabilities to make our own decisions at all times and have, have our physical and mental integrity respected on an equal basis with others. It further ignores the severe pain, trauma and irreparable damage to life, health and integrity caused by psychiatric coercion. As a first step, there is an urgent need for recognizing the severity of the harm done and the suffering inflicted on the victims, and for this knowledge to be implemented in national policies, law and practice. In March this year, Norway was reviewed by the CRPD Committee, and the Civil Society Coalition of Norway, representing 125 Norwegian DPOs and CSOs, called for the withdrawal of Norway's interpretive declarations to the CRPD, the incorporation of the CRPD into Norwegian law and the ratification of the optional protocol to the convention, which with all these significant steps to remove barriers for implementation. In addition to the above mentioned, an important step Norway could take is to develop laws and policies to replace regimes of substitute decision-making by supported decision-making that respects the person's autonomy, will, and preferences, and to remove functional capacity standards throughout Norwegian law, including criteria that declares a person not competent to give consent. Norway should ensure that all mental health services is based on the free and informed consent of the person concerned, including in emergency situations, and repeal all legal provisions that authorize and enforce and non-consensual interventions or treatment in the mental health system. Thank you. Thank you, Hedda. Um, I now give the floor to Alberto Vasquez. Thank you, Tina, and thank you for the invitation. Um, in the case of Peru, I think we also need to keep working towards um, the absolute prohibition standard. And, and just to give some context, we, 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 we achieved a, a, a reform of, of the civil code to ban guardianship. But that didn't include uh, all, all forms of decision making, especially in the case of emergencies. And, and our health legislation, which is particularly the, the issue, is still authorized treatment without consent in emergencies. So basically, that's, that's the point that we're still fighting on. And two weeks ago, against uh, the advocacy of, of civil society, the government actually passed a mental health legislation. It's true that the mental health legislation avoids referring to voluntary treatment, which is good, but at the same time reiterates that in cases of psychiatric emergencies, there is no need for informed consent. It puts a cap, it puts a limit of 12 hours for, for, for emergencies, uh, but still this reinforced the idea that people can be, can be coerced during such situations. So, what, what we're thinking in terms of, of from the movement is, is how we need to problematize this issue of emergencies and, and we need to, to explore how this is discriminatorily applied to people with psychosocial disabilities because emergencies in the general context of health don't really apply in the same way that is applied in the case of people with psychosocial disabilities and mental health services. So we need to move away from this notion of risk to self or to others to understand emergencies and to have a discussion about actually what it means a mental health emergency, a psychiatric emergency, 
if it means something at all, and, and how it should be applied. But the second thing we, we're thinking is how to frame these responses now that we have still this gap in terms of how regulated emergencies, even if it's just 12 hours, how to move the standard from, from, from what we have today, which is coercion, towards what Tina will call positive responses. Emotional support, decision-making support, non-coercive and non-medicalized support, safe spaces and respite services. And I just want to close thinking, I think we, we, we need to be optimistic. Um, and I think a, a good strength that we have from the movement in Peru is that Peru is going through a very deep mental health reforms towards community-based interventions. According to the Ombudsman Office, we have a very low rate of involuntary treatment. According to the Ombudsman Office, it's less than 100 cases a year. I don't think it's true. But at the same time, it's true that we have very few, fed, very few beds, and that explains lower numbers of, of involuntary treatment. But the most important part is we are organizing for the first time different groups of users and survivors and people with psychosocial disabilities are working together. And a big coalition is still a small because we're not so many, but I think that's a positive step towards keep pushing towards we need to discuss this issue of, of emergencies.